Okay, nice to see everybody. Welcome back to Lighthouse. Thank you. Back to the Yom Tovim. I'm glad I'm the, um, the first speaker to initiate it, I guess. There's something to be said for that, to be the first. Boshen Buchaya. Did I say that correctly? Boshen Buchaya. Buchaya. How do you say it? Long live Buchaya? That's not what I'm saying. Boshen. Boshen Buchaya. Boshen Buchaya. How do you say it? Ah, Boshen Ah, That's it. Boshen Buchaya. Bukhaya Boshan. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you know, Bukhayans. You say like Boshan Jew. Boshan Jew, you know. are very interesting people. I have to say that I, I went to get my hair cut today, and I was at a barber. And, and naturally, he's a Bukharian barber. <laughs> and he's, there's all these, these kids, I guess, the young guys, like early 19, 18, 19, 20, just teaching them how to cut hair. I was the only one there. I walk in, while he's cutting my hair, we're having a whole theological discussion about the book of Genesis. You know, where was Adam born? Who was he married to? How long were they married? How many children did they have? So I was thinking, where else do you go, you know, that you're getting your hair cut? And the barbers are, are you know, instead of cutting your hair, they're talking to you about the book of Gracious. You know, I thought that was pretty interesting. It was very difficult to answer because, you know, they were trimming my beard. So, you know, was like, I was kind of waiting for him to, like, you know, stop before I could answer, but I, I couldn't. But they were... They just wanted to talk about these issues, you know? And that's very impressive. I don't think you'd find that in an Italian barbershop. Only a Bukharian barbershop. Mm-hmm. That's the Jewish people. Okay. So what I want to do with you tonight is I want to take you through the first day of the creation of Adam in the Chabah. And on this first day of creation, really a question comes up, which is, you know, I guess it's a question that we have as well. You know, has everybody ever been to the Bronx Zoo? And it's a good place to go to the Bronx Zoo. And if you go to the Bronx Zoo, what's your favorite exhibit? The monkeys. The monkeys. And if you go to the monkeys, specifically the gorillas. Because the gorillas are so human looking. And it's very fascinating to watch them because they do very human things. You know, they pick up their children and they chase after the children and they break up fights. And, you know, it's just so interesting to see these animals acting in, in such a, a human-like way. And the reality is, if we studied the DNA of a gorilla, what would we find? His DNA is identical to our DNA. No, we differ. What's that? We have a little bit different. DNA. What's that, Dr. Khan? What did you say? A little bit different. That's why we said from Gaion we came from. We, we, well, our, but if you seek, but our DNA is very close. And our, our, there's a strong resemblance in the way they conduct themselves. And, it's almost possible to look at that ape and to say, you know, what's the difference between you and, and me? And in fact, people have said that, right? The whole theories that are, are built around that concept. Evolution, that we evolved, we're just a higher level ape with more intelligence or something of that nature. That's what evolutionists hold. And as you look the ape in the face and you watch him you know, interact with his children and you, and you think, wow, you're so, so, you're so human-like, you know, the question really, is, what is the difference between us? You know, that's a, a question. It's very interesting to me that one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet is the letter Kuf. The letter Kuf, you know what a Kuf looks like? A Kuf, Kuf you can imagine a Kuf in your mind? Mm-hmm. Kuf looks like this, right? You know what it means? It means a monkey. monkey. It's, it's a monkey. A Kuf. A Kuf. How interesting it is that one of the building blocks of creation, you know, the Aleph Beit, the 22 letters of the Aleph Beit, are the letters from which Hashem built all of creation. So one of, so to speak, the primordial building blocks is a letter that means an ape or a monkey. So there must be something very interesting about the monkey. Now, what's interesting about the monkey, the Zohar tells us, is that it excels in imitation. It imitates. It can imitate a human being. And it's supposed to remind us that we're supposed to imitate. But who are we supposed to imitate? Yes. We're supposed to imitate Kodesh Baruch. That's where the first letter of Kedusha starts with the Kuf. We're supposed to imitate Kedusha. The Holech Bedrach, to go in God's ways. So the ape reminds us, be an imitator. But at the same time, don't make the mistake to think you're an ape. You know, how do I know that? Now, there's a word in Hebrew for a righteous person. What's, the right, what's a righteous person called? Sadiq. Sadiq. The root is Sadi Dalad Kuf. 
tzedek, tzaddik, right? If you break up those three letters into the component parts, you actually have tzad, latzud. What does tzad mean in Hebrew? Tzad is the side. Latzud means to trap or to hunt, because the way you trap is you place sides around the animal, true? You can't do it on Shabbos. Tzayad, tzad, The letter kof, kof means what? A monkey. You know what a tzaddik is? Somebody who traps his monkey. He contains and he controls the animal inside of himself. And a kadosh is, the letters for kadosh, someone who's really holy, kuf dalad shin, if you rearrange the letters, it's dash kuf. He tramples his monkey. Not only does he control, he tramples it. So we see all these hints to the aspect, yes, there is an animal out there that resembles mankind. And you're supposed to follow its example of imitation to imitate God. But don't be confused to think that's you. He looks like you. He has the same DNA as you. But he's just an animal. And what makes him different than you? He might be very intelligent. I'm sure there are very intelligent gorillas. I'm sure of it. But what makes him different than us? We have something else. We have neshama. We have a soul. We have an animal, the body, which is very similar to the ape. But we have a neshama. We have a soul. And that soul has to drive and has to direct the body. We have to tzad the kuf. We have to trap it. We have to harness it. We have to direct it. We have to use it in the service of God. You know, it's very fascinating. I just noticed this just the other day. Yesterday, in fact, I saw Rav Hirsch. You know, in English, we have a word forbidden. Something is forbidden. What does forbidden mean? Forbidden means not a loud. How do you say forbidden in Russian? How? Zaprish. You, you said right, Bella? You said right. Okay. Zaprish. 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 Means forbidden. Did I say correct? Zaprish. How do you say it in Bukharin? Huh? It's a long word. It's a long word. Don't say it. How do you say it in Persian? Who is Persian? Who are Persians? Okay. Any Persians here? It's the same. Language. Same. Interesting. And in America, could we say forbidden? Would it be surprised you if I surprised you if I told you okay. that in Hebrew, in Lashon Hakodesh, there is no word for forbidden? Asu. Asu. Oh, asu. My yeah, father yeah. used to say asu. Yes, forbidden. Asu. You're right. Asu. My father used to say kibuchai. What does forbidden mean? Forbidden means I'm not allowed to do something. Forbidden. It's forbidden. Don't touch it. Don't do it. That's not what lesor means. No. Le'asur doesn't mean that at all. I'll give you Baruch Ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech Ha'olam Matir Asurim. Hashem, you are the source of all blessing, the king of the universe, who releases imprisoned. the forbidden. Um, no? No, the imprisoned. Oh. <coughs> Asurim doesn't mean forbidden, does it? It means to be imprisoned, to be controlled. For example, a sore means to, to harness on a, on a horse, take the reins, and to, to control the horse with the reins is isur. A sore in Hebrew doesn't mean to forbid, it means to control or to contain, to use the energy of something else for a greater purpose. God says, you know, there's no word in the Torah for forbidden. You know why? Because there's no such thing as the world being forbidden. There are things which true we are not allowed to do but it's only because by not being allowed to do those things we control the other part of who we are it helps bring out something else it's like when you take the reins of a horse right and you you're that's that means that sword. you direct it you control it what do you do you allow the full energy of the animal to go forward so yeah certain things in life we have to control but it's only for the purpose of bringing out something even greater it's not just forbidden because it's forbidden it's controlled for the purpose of harnessing it and bringing out a greater strength. Isn't that interesting? Very fascinating. What a tzaddik does is he tzad the kof. He controls his monkey. He harnesses the strength of the animal for the purpose of God, serving God. He's not ruled by his monkey. He controls it. He uses it. He's the rider. It's the horse. And he uses that energy to go forward and to make good things happen in the world. That's a tzaddik. You don't just let the horse run around, run without... A rider. Now the reason I bring this up to you is because if we're going to go back to the first day of creation 
in the Garden of Eden. I'm going to suggest to you that maybe this question wasn't so clear. That Adam and Chava perhaps had a dilemma. The dilemma is, here I am created, but who am I? Who is the real me? What am I? I have an animal, and the animal is speaking to me with all sorts of languages of drives and wants and looks, and, and I, I definitely, you know, I'm, I'm very similar to the animals in many ways. I have a lust and I have a passion, and I, you know, and I, have a, I, I want to do what the animals do, and I want to eat, and I want to protect myself, and I want comfort. And At the same time, there's the voice of God. And I want to suggest to you, perhaps, on the first day of creation, in the Garden of Eden, which didn't last very long, it only lasted, according to Gamor and Rosh Hashanah, approximately six hours, in that first day in the Garden of Eden, maybe this question wasn't so clear. And let's take a look, and let's see what I mean. If we go back into the Garden of Eden, we see the first thing that happens. V'yom Elokim. And God said, Nasa Odom Bitsalmeinu Ibadusainu. God said, Let's make man in our image and in our likeness. Who's God speaking to, by the way? Let's make man. The He's speaking to the angels. Good, speaking to the angels. Very good. And what happens? They agree. And why does he have to why does he have to speak to the angels, by the way? Why speak to the angels? To show politeness. To show derch hertz, that before you make a major decision in life, you first ask advice. Even God is asking the lower being, the angels, should we make man? Teaches you before you make major decisions, you ask advice. Before you get married, everybody who's not married, don't just come home and say, Oh, I'm married, I'm engaged. Ask advice. Ask advice. Ask your teachers, ask your parents, ask your friends. And hopefully he'll ask you. Okay. Now, here it goes. So what happens? It says, The first creation of mankind was actually Zokha Vedakeva. It was male and female. Rashi says the first creation was a creation which had a face looking this way, which was the male face, and a female face looking this way. Zokha Vedakeva Baosam. Male and female created them. And it defines a little bit what men and women are like. A man's vision of the world is to forge forward so to speak, to create, of inspiration, to go out. A woman's job is to make sure that it's secure, to look back, as it were, to make sure that the line is straight and where he's going is solid. Zokhav the Keva Barosa. And then the story progresses, and God says the very famous line that Lo tov Adam levado. God says it's not good for a man to be alone. Now, apparently, this first creation of Adam, it was male-female, but it was really one creation. And he was alone. Why was he alone? He really couldn't give to anybody. There was no one to give to. It just really was purely, his, purely himself. So what does God do? It says that... Shem made the garden to the east and placed of the man whom he had formed. And what happened was. What's that? I think like this is like Gan and I think the perfect setup for scene. Was that the perfect what? Set up for scene. You set up the scene? Make a scene. Oh, well let's see. Let's see what happens. So he places Adam in the garden. Let's find the verse here. Okay. So he planted the garden in Eden, placed it with the man he had formed. Now we know that the a, a rivers, there are different rivers in the Garden of Eden. And Hashem placed man in the Garden of Eden to work in it to guard it. And Hashem then commanded Adam. He gave a commandment. What was the commandment that he gave Adam? What was that? Well, what do you say, Bella? Do not eat, do not the eat. Tree. Who agrees with Bella? That was the first commandment that Adam received. Do not touch the tree. Do not touch the do not touch the tree. Do not eat the tree. Don't eat the tree. Who's heard my lecture before here? Who knew that even without my lecture? You heard my lecture before? 
when he created just Adam? Yeah, yeah he right. Say, he said, name the animals. Well, we'll get there in a second. First thing, he placed in the Garden of Eden. He placed in the Garden of Eden. To work in the Garden. It's not yet around. It's still one being. He commanded the Odom saying, be call Eitzagan from every tree of the garden, Ochel Tochel. You, yes, you must eat. You are obligated to eat. First commandment is to enjoy every fruit of the garden. Let me ask you a question. Is Hashem interested that we should have pleasure in this world? Yes. The first commandment he gives Adam is enjoy every fruit of the garden. Umi eats Adas Tovara Lo Tochel But one tree the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. Because the day when you eat from it, you will surely die. One tree. It's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. A tree that has das. What's that? Where somehow eating from this tree will create knowledge of something which is good and bad. Good and evil. Stay away from one thing. That's all. How interesting it is that people oftentimes think that the first commandment is not to do something. As if God wants to restrict our pleasures in this world. I'm going to see why in a minute. But really the first commandment was, you're obligated to enjoy everything that God created. Except one thing. One thing. And it was a tree from which if you would eat, good and bad would be mixed. Whatever that means for now. But there would be a mixture somehow. You'd be able to be confused by what is good and what is bad. Perhaps we would express that your desires would increase. You would have real desires, a stronger amount of desire, whereby you'd be confused by what you want versus what God wants. So God's saying, there's one thing I'm restricting, but I'm restricting it only so you should have greater clarity. I'm not just restricting it for the sake of restricting it. I'm restricting it so that you should have greater clarity of what I want from you in life. God, I don't want you to have that confusion as your desires first my desires. I don't want that. I'd rather you be in harmony with my desires. So one thing they can't do. Now what happens? Hashem then says, Hashem Elohim, God says, Lo tov adam levado. It's not good for man to be alone. Eza konegdo. I need to create for him an Eza Konegdo, a helpmate. Rashi says, we know the famous Rashi, it means Eve. If a woman, if a man is going on the right path, he's going to be an Azer, she'll be a helper. If a man's on the wrong path, she'll be Konegdo. A woman has the capacity to be a spiritual compass for a man. There's a much higher level sense of God's will. Now, very interesting. At this point in the story, the story breaks. And it has an interlude. And listen to what the interlude is. It says... Hashem created from the ground now all the animals of the field and all the birds of heaven and he gave Adam the assignment to see who said it before what name he'll call these animals the name that Adam would give it would be the name the animal would have Adam was given the job of Naming the animal kingdom. He had the intimate knowledge of the animals, and he understood Lashon HaKodesh, the Hebrew language, and he understood when he looked at an elephant, you have to be a peel. Looked at a horse, you have to be a sus. You know, he, he looked at a lion, R-E-A is what you are. He understood how these letters described perfectly the essence of the animals. And he was given that job to name the animals. For Yikra Odom, Shmos the Kola Behemo Lofa Shemayim. And he gave names to all the animals and the birds, the Chalchais of Sode, and the animals of the field. But he could not find an animal that he could relate to. And Hashem caused a great sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept. And Hashem took one of his ribs, or Rashi says it's not ribs, he took his other side, because the cell can mean a side, he split off the other side, and he sealed up the flesh, and Hashem gave the side, or the rib, which he took from Adam, as a wife, and he presented her to Adam, creation of Eve. 
V'yomer Adam, and Adam said, Zos upon this time, etzim me atzmi obasar me basare. This time, finally, bone of my bone, flesh from my flesh, l'zos yikra isha, and that's what we call her an isha, ki me ish loch chazot, because from the man she was taken. Now, Rashi says in a medrash over here, which kind of sounds almost comical, but you've got to listen to this, because it's very strange. Rashi's bothered by the words, when Chava is presented to Adam, what does Adam say? What does Adam say? He says the words, Zosapam. Zos, this time, meaning finally, this time, etzimi, atzimi, ubasimi, basari, bone from my bone, and flesh from my flesh. What does Adam mean, this time? See what Rashi quotes? This is what Rashi quotes over here. Tell me this isn't the weirdest thing you ever heard in your life. It says, Zosapam, Midlam made, it teaches us, Shabbat Adam al Kol Behem of Chaya. That Adam not only named the animals, but he dated all the animals. But he was not able to be at peace with any of them until finally Chaba was created. I, I, I mean, dated means, I'm trying to use a nice word. What is dated? Dated means he took her out to La Pizga. They went out to the Chosan. They had a little, uh, you know, Monte. No. You know. Let's keep it rated PG. We're going to keep it rated. We're to keep it rated PG for the G G for grandmas for this um, for this discussion. But it's that's what he did. It says he was he went he went out with the animals. You know, he went out. Hashem told him to, or he did it on his own. That, it seems like that was part of the assignment of of Hashem gave him the task of. Naming the animals, and it seems that naming the animals was not all that he was supposed to do. He was supposed to name the animals, and in the process of naming, he was supposed to discover if any of these animals could be his wife. So he was he was da- dating, dating. My, first dating. time I heard. I'm, 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 Rashi, I'm calling you Rashi. I'm, I'm, I'm not making it up. It's so, Rashi. so maybe he was looking for company, like you know, like someone to hang out with. What's the like, exact hang out with dog? Right, right. So that's kind of cool, but wanted. A closer hanging out, but it wasn't. Okay, so yeah, I, oh, I hear what you said. Yeah, I mean, this. Sorry, we'll take that wording. Oh, the, the exact wording? Okay, well, no, the exact wording. He managed to do that. That's oh, when they oh, first saw that he was oh, oh. So, uh, give him a so, <laughs> they're saying, saying good. Let me read the exact words here. It says, Zosapam, this time, Adam says, this time, finally, when he was created, he says, Zosapam, finally, Milam made, it teaches us, Shabo Adam al Kol Behem of Achaya. He came upon all the animals, below this Karadaito Behem. And his mind was not at peace. Maybe he means he was talking to them. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I, I, I hate to tell you, know, I'm, I'm sorry if I have to bring this from a G rating up a little bit, but it sounds like, you know, they were going out to dinner. You know, I don't know what they were doing. They were going out to dinner, you know. <laughs> What, what's that language that they use? When they, you know, for my hand. How do you say that? You know, for my hand. No, the, 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 how do you say? How do you say? How do you say? Adasima. That's what I'm looking for. Why do you say again? Say again. How do you say? Adasima. Yeah, right. Adasima. You know. I guess you know they, they're having a great time. They were going. They were eating. They were going. I guess they were eating steaks. If they were, yeah, you know, they were. It depends on the animal. But you know. But but the question. Yes. Adasima. You know. They were. I mean, they're feeding. Oh, so don't bite me. Adasima. Oh, that's that's what? I think the part that we're really trying to absorb is the part where God said we should do that. That was the part that yes, commanded. Yes, I yes, think that's yes. What's your name? What's your name? Um, Tova. Tova, Tova. Yeah. Tova says something very, very brilliant. Yeah. The question is, what, what, what did God have in mind, Tova? What, what, what did God have in mind? Didn't Hashem in his infinite wisdom know that the giraffe would not make a good shit of Adam? You know, she's so tall. You know, like, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, or, or like the ostrich would not just somehow would not look good in the wedding picture. You know, whatever. You know, or, or the elephant. You know, I, I mean, like, what, what, what? No, what? that is dangerous. I think animals. What? So the shaman's okay. Going to be spiritual on me. Going to be spiritual. Did he have babies? 
No, he didn't marry them. He didn't marry. He was. He went out with them. They dated. They dated. They were no, no marriage. No dating. They were dating. Oh, see, ma. No, all the animals had high respect. So, so, but the question, the question I really have, and it's a very serious question, is what was God's intention? Why did God seem to make Adam go through this, this facade, as it were, this, this exercise to not only name the animal kingdom, but to see if he could make with it, see if he could find his, his other half from the animal kingdom? I know. Yes. To appreciate his new wife. Oh, so that's a very good answer. That's a very good answer. The, the one he would discover, Chava, he, he would really appreciate, he would, he would really appreciate that... Uh, that that Chava is really somebody who belongs to him and is like him, a hundred percent. That's a good answer. That's a very interesting answer, also. That's a very interesting answer. Yeah. Or is it that um, he wants to see how, as a man, he would react spiritually to an to an animal? animal. You're saying very good, everybody. You're saying you're all saying something which I think is very in line. You're saying something very very in line here, but. Let's just hold the question. We're going to get to the answer. We're going, to, we're going to pinpoint the answer a little sharper in a moment. But the question is certainly a good question. That a shaman's infant wisdom knows the elephant, the ostrich, the kangaroo are, are not proper shaduchim. I mean, many of you have probably, in the process of dating, have probably gone out with people and you've thought, you know, I might as well be out with a kangaroo for all I have in common with him, right? You know, like, I might as well be out with a hippopotamus. Right? You know, he eats like a hippopotamus. You know, what am I, you know, what did the shatchan have in mind? You, you might be thinking that, but God is excellent, shatchan. And Hashem doesn't, Hashem knew this, yet, yet he was making Adam go through this exercise of dating the animal kingdom before he found Chava. And it's a very, very interesting point. I think we have to just hold it in the back of our minds for a moment. And perhaps it's this this young lady suggested, that it could be that to appreciate Chava more. That could be, and might be part of it, and I'm not going to disagree with that. I think there's something that might even be deeper, and it might be even connected with the test that Adam is going to experience in a few moments. Okay? Can I say one more? Yes, sure. Maybe it's if he would have, Hashem would have given him Chava immediately, while he's married to her, if she ever gets on his nerves, he would have been like, why am I with her when I could be with that beautiful monkey? <laughs> that's why he knows, okay, nobody's for me except her. Uh -huh. that's, that's, I think, a similar type to really appreciate. Yes, to really appreciate. But it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating Rashi. It's a fascinating Rashi. Yeah, to... um, I heard this, uh, David Aaron. Yeah, there. Mm -hmm. He wrote that he, uh, Adam had to experience, I guess, dates that were on a lower level, mm -hmm. on a lower spiritual level. Uh -huh. and everything. Right, everything. That once he met Hava, he felt, ah, oh, there's someone that's opposite me but parallel. Mm, mm. So someone that can help him, I guess, get to where he needs to go. But at the same time, someone that he can feel equal to. Very nice. Very nice. That, that, that interesting. That, that he had to experience certain lower levels of, uh, of dating in order to find somebody who is, you're right, different, Azer Connecto, but... It's me. It's on the same. It's on. Very fascinating. Very, very fascinating ideas. I'm very interested. Yeah. I think we can also like study the whole world and so like the whole world is created for Adam, so it gives you pleasure. Oh, 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 oh. interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting what you're saying. That's interesting. Yeah, right. There were no prob there were no prohibitions. There's one. The whole world is created. Right. There's no prohibit. You know. Right. The question is, does it make sense though? You know, Adam had seichel, a tremendous seichel. Tremendous wisdom, you know. It, it, he wouldn't do anything unless it made sense. You know, what, what made sense about this, and, and why would God seem to command it? Seems like God suggested it in His commandment to name the animals. But maybe like He's going to, to date wherever like He's doing. He's well, going to get more, more knowledge about like animals. So he so he's going to be more mature. It's, it's going to be mature in something. I think you're saying very good. Now, it, listen to the structure of the story. Though. You know, you have to when you when you study Torah, especially Bereshit and Chumash. You have, to listen, you have to follow God's movements. You have to look what's happening over here. What does God do? God creates Adam. First he creates him as one unit. And by the way, the Ramban says the reason for that is because when Chava will finally be separated off from him, he'll be able to relate to her like he's, she's really his other half. So God goes through this two-step process so that when husband and wife do come together in united marriage, there is an actual spiritual reality of finding the other part of who you are. And therefore the level of giving can be a new level of giving, giving really to who you are. So God wants that. So it goes through this two-step process of creating this sort of um, heterogeneous being, splitting off the other side, so to speak, making, then saying, look, Adam, it's not good to be alone. 
One would think right there when he says, oh, it's not good to be alone, you'd think he'd go right into the creation of Chava. No, but that's what I said. There was an interlude. The Torah says, Lo tov helis the Adam levado, and then all of a sudden comes the command to go name the animal kingdom. Adam goes out to name the animal kingdom. Finally, he can't find anybody who is right for him. As he says, Lo matza is a connecto. Shem then puts him in a tardemo, deep sleep, takes his other side or his rib, whatever you want to translate it. Rashi says his other half, the other side, seals up the flesh under it, presents Chava to him, and he says, Zo sapam, etzimi, etzimi, basimi, sorry. He says, finally, I found someone who is like me. And Rashi says right there, finally I found, teaches us that first he tried to test to see if there was any animal in creation could be his wife. What happened? Why was there that interlude, that separation? Keep that in mind. Okay, keep that in mind. It's going to be a very important point. Just, 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 just keep it in mind. Next thing that happens is we're introduced to the next character. The Hanachash. The snake. And the Nachash was the craftiest animal that's crafty with a C, not with a K like Rabbi Kraft. He was the craftiest animal I shall also show look him. For Yoma Ela Ishan. Okay, let's see. Now, first we're interested to the Nachash. Let's stop right there. Who is the Nachash? So, we understand the Nachash was a, a Nachash, a walking, talking creature. And how interesting it is that we're not supposed to be surprised by that. Oh, there's a, there's a Nachash that comes out and starts talking, you know? Uh, you know, sometimes in the Torah we are surprised by animals talking. For example, Donkey. Yeah, Bill Amstaki. Oh, he's talking, yeah. Nachash, oh, he talks. Right, you know, as if this dialogue with this animal is, is totally natural and totally normal. And he's very intelligent. And he walks straight up, almost like a person. And it says he's an arum. What does arum mean in Hebrew? Arum, you translate, it means naked. It means naked. Who was naked? The Nachash? The Nachash was arum. You see that word a lot in the story. He was arum, he was naked. Maybe it means that he didn't have fur like the other animals. That could be. But it seems to imply he was arum, meaning he was, he was wily, he was crafty with a small c. But you know, it's interesting, by the way, in English, if, if I say the naked truth, what does that mean? I'll tell you the real truth, doesn't it? I'm not trying to hide anything. It's the naked truth. So interesting, the word arum, naked, oftentimes in language, doesn't really mean to be cunning. It means to be exposed, to be open. Yet here, his nakedness somehow is used to describe a cunningness. Yes, that does not make sense. What does that mean? Let's think about that. He's going to say something now to Chava, and it's described as cunning, yet the word for cunning is a word that really means naked, which means sort of open and revealed. As if he's going to be cunning in a very open and revealed way. So keep that in mind for a moment. Now, who else was the Nachash? Cunning is, uh, is like um, sly, you know, um, wily, crafty, those type of words, synonyms, like you know, sly. Kitri in Russian. What? Kitri. Kitri. Sneaky. 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 You know, the word Nachash, by the way, you want to say something interesting? You know, we know that after the, flood, after the Tower of Babel, Shem mixed up all the languages. So all the languages in the world, the seven languages of the world, are really just mixed up Hebrew. Did you know that? The only language in the world, the only language in the world was Lashon Kodesh. After the Dorf Logan, this week's Parsha, the Tower of Babel, she mixed up Russian and Kosh and created 70 languages. So you know that Russian is really just mixed up Hebrew. You know, Bukharian, well, for sure that's mixed up Hebrew, right? Did you know that English is mixed up Hebrew? I'll give you an example. What's the word for snake in Hebrew? Nachash. Interesting. If I put the shin first, I put the nun second, and I put the chet third, what does that sound like? Snake. How interesting. The word nachash, if I flip the letters around and I put the shin, nun, chet, it sounds very much like snech. Do you hear this example of one of the words where you see that English is just mixed up Lashon HaKodesh? I have a book at home with 10,000 words like that. Very fascinating. All right, let's go back to the story. Who else was the nachash? The nachash was an angel. He was an angel. What, which angel was he, according to our tradition? He was the? The satan. The satan. The Nachash was the Satan. Why Question. Is body? Why make him right. Is je- right. The Nachash, the Satan was placed in this body of this being called the Nachash. Now, in Judaism, 
Is the Satan a good angel or a bad angel? Good. Good angel or bad angel? Well, he's good to God. Satan is a bad angel. But he's good at doing his job. He's good at doing his job, true. <laughs> okay, let, let's get this very, very clear. Please get this very clear with me. But don't make a mistake. Yeah. Satan is good at doing his job. Okay, good. Question. Oh, let's take a vote. Who says Satan is a good angel? Who's, who says Satan is a bad angel? Okay, well, anybody says he's bad. He's bad. <laughs> <laughs> What's the correct answer? Good. Satan a good angel or a bad angel? Oh, good. Oh, good. I would like to explain what it is. Satan, I'll let me explain to you something. In Judaism, there can be no such thing as a bad angel. The Satan is God's most important angel. His job is to test us, to intensify our free choice, and thereby allowed us, allow us to have greater reward. He's the only angel that's happy when we don't listen to him. Most angels are happy when we listen and we follow what they're telling us. The Satan doesn't want us to listen. He doesn't want us to fail. But his job is to test us so that the reward we receive will be even greater. That's the Nachash. That's the Satan. Now, I'll tell you something. In Christianity, the Satan is viewed as an angel who fell from grace. An angel who rebelled against God. He rebelled against God and he started an evil sort of counter kingdom to God. That's what Christianity believes. And in order to defeat the Satan, there's only one way to do it. You have to believe in Yashka. That's what they believe. The only way you're going to overcome the Satan is if you believe and you accept Yashka. If not, you are going to Help. Right. I don't mean you personally. Don't be. I mean, I, I've just you. Right. That, that, you know. That's what they believe. Now I'll tell you. You know. I'll tell you something. Now, listen to, very carefully to this. I'm telling you. What number in the secular world, in the Christian world, is considered to be a cursed number? Six. 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 Good. And what other number? Thirteen. 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 Let's start with thirteen. Friday the thirteenth. Let me ask you a question. In Judaism, what number perhaps is our most beloved number? Seven. 13. 13. When do we take the little boy and bar mitzvah him? 13. How many attributes does God have? 13. Yud Gimel Midos of Hashem. 13 Midos of Hashem. We love the number 13. Now, I'll tell you why we love the number 13 so much. Because the word Echad, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, listen to Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem Echad, Hashem you are one. If I, take the, if I take the word echad, the aleph is one, the chet is eight, the dalet is four, what's the gematria? Thirteen, true. Now what's special about the number thirteen? You know what's special about number thirteen? Anything in the physical world, listen carefully, it's a little bit deep. Any, everything in the physical world, you'll notice, has how many lines? One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And the space that it contains is called the thirteenth. Thirteen for us represents all points, the complete unity of creation. And that's why Echad is Gematria of thirteen. And that's why, by the way, the word Ahava, which means love, Aleph is one, He is five. Base is two, He is five, is also 13, because the idea of love is to try to become a complete oneness, right? 13. But the 12 points, which contain the, 13th, the 13 within, is the aspect of everything coming together in complete and absolute unity. And that's what we believe as Jews. There's complete unity in this world. And you know what that means, complete unity? There can be no angels that are separate from God. There can't be rebellious bad angels. Unity echad means everything is controlled and designated and part of God's plan and will. But I'll tell you something. In Christianity, you know why they hate the number 13? Because if there's complete unity in the world, you know what that means? It means the sultan must work for God. But the sultan works for God. What do we need Yashka for? Because the whole purpose of Yashka is that if without Yashka, you can't overcome the sultan. Our answer to that is, yeah, yeah, what, what do you need Yashka for? <laughs> That's, what do you need Jesus for? Right? The whole premise of theology is based on the fact that there's a rebellious angel. 
13 teaches us a complete unity. That's the whole theology. That that that. Yeah, you know. but Christian teaches oh. sins. Oh, thank you. That's the only reason why he's such an unlucky number. That's a pretty, pretty, pretty heavy reason. It's a pretty good what reason. What about that six? Means? What is the six? Because six is also the idea. Six is six is also the idea of, like for example, the Jewish star, right? Yeah. You have how many? How many? You have, you have six points. Six is also the idea of like of, of expression out of the physical world, unity in the physical world. Six and twelve. Six is half of it, and twelve is the completion of it, and the space it contains is the thirteen. So why is six, six, six? That's why for us, we you know, well, we hold you know, like a Jewish star. It shows interlocking of six points. Six points is the idea that you could have six points of, of emerging together of the physical and the spiritual. You know, that's complete. The completion of the physical world is six. In Christianity, they hold you can't have that. It's like you know, you have one one point of inter, intersection. It's a different discussion. So all this voodoo stuff and, and all these bad angels, they're really with Hashem? God forbid. Nothing can be a bad angel, right? There's no such thing. There's no such whatever thing. they are. Right. There, there could be angels which have the job to perhaps, you know, work in Kochos or Tuma and things like that, whatever it is. Yeah. But everything is unified by God. And the Satan is God's most important angel. He is not a rebellious angel. He is a wonderful angel. At the time of Mashiach, it says that God is going to shech the Satan. It doesn't mean he's going to take a bullet like in Stalinist Russia and shoot him in the head. It doesn't mean that. What it means? No, it means what shechita? When you do shechita on an animal, are you murdering the animal? Or are you uplifting the animal for a higher purpose? Uplifting. Right, saying that the something's going to be uplifted back to the place. We're going to understand that he was helping us all along. He was trying to test us in order that we should have greater free choice, and by having greater free choice, have greater reward in the next world. That's the satan, is you hear? Okay. Yeah, you got it? No such thing as rebellious self. It doesn't work that way. That's Christianity. That's not Judaism. We're very influenced by outside ideologies. So the Satan comes along in the guise, in the disguise, as it were, of a creature called the snake. The Nachash. Okay? Now he's a Satan, but he's the Satan. His job is to test Adam and Eve in order to encourage them to, to eat. That's the test. There's only one test now in the Garden of Eden. And it's a real test. You know, you have to understand that the, the tree, the Eitz Das Tov Ra, it has certain descriptions about it. Descriptions are that apparently it was, it was good to smell. It was pleasing to the eye. It was Tov Lahaskil. There was something about it that you just wanted to, to contemplate it, to think about it, like poetry. Or sunset. There was something enormously tempt, you know, tempt, tempt, tempting about it. And apparently, it had all the tests that a human being can face in one one thing. You know, all te- all right, <laughs> very good. All tests in life really are a combination of, of you know, of, of different desires, either physical desires, or emotional desires, or intellectual desires. All tests in life fall into those three categories. The Eitz Das apparently was it, it was good to the eye. There was a physical desire. It was, it apparently, it, it, it gave you desires of, for honor. It, it was intellectually something very, very attractive about it. And that's why there's a debate in the Talmud what it really was. Some say that it was in etrog, the most beautiful of fruits. That's the test of beauty. Some say it was actually grapes, which you create wine from, which is the test of emotions. Some say that it was actually figs, which is a cash crop, a fig tree, taena which is a test of kavod, of honor. And the fourth opinion said that it was actually a bread tree. That it was a bread tree. tree. That it actually was bread. That in the Garden of Eden, bread grew from the trees. And that, you know, that's when we make the blessing on bread, what do we say? Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu melech alam, hamotzi lechem mina aretz. God, you're the source of all blessing, the king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. We don't bring bread forth from the earth, do we? What do we do? We have to plant the seed. We have to let the seed rise. We then have to harvest it, thresh it. We then have to um, dash it, separate it. We then have to grind it, knead it, bake it. Actually, there are 10 steps in the bread breaking process. It's very difficult to bring bread forth in the earth. True? That's why, by the way, when you make the blessing on bread, you put your 10 fingers on the bread to remind us of the 10 processes that have to go from seed to, to bread. And that's why, of course, you know this, that in the blessing there are 10 words. You know that, right? Baruch atah shem. Elokeinu melech alam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Ten words to remind us of the ten processes of breaking bread. But why do we say, God, you brought forth the bread from the earth? It's a lie. 
The answer is in the Garden of Eden, there were bread trees. You could go to a tree. There was a pumpernickel tree, a bagel tree. <laughs> there was a lipioshka tree. That you, you know, there was a natoki tree. There was not, this is true. There was a natoki tree. You know the umbrella bread? You know what I mean? What are they called? Natoki? Natoki. There was an umbrella bread tree. There, 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 what? No, there was. There was a tree. But there was one problem because when, those, when they would ripen, they would fall and they would crack. So God had a little angel standing there with a colorful yarmulke and he would catch them. Yeah. yeah. And, he, and then he would, he would bring it, you know, he would serve it to people. You never heard that? I heard that at Vly Place, the bakery. They told me. What? No. You have a breadfruit tree. What? You know what? did you say? A breadfruit tree. A breadfruit. Yeah. Really, really. That's like, very, like bread. very fascinating. Very fascinating. Very cool. Okay. The taste of the like a bread. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. You know what is funny? A loofah. Okay. Okay. Kind of like what? What was that bread? A loofah kind of like is a, a fruit. It's a fruit. I know. I know. It kind of looks like. Really, really. Yeah. Very fascinating. Interesting. But those were the four possibilities. It was not an apple. It was anything but an apple. Okay, that was some Renaissance artist. Do you have a question? Um, about the, the graph, but don't we say because like, we think that it's an R, F, and the relationship. Could be. That, that's possible. That, that's possible. Mm-hmm. Right, right. That's very nice also. Is it the main reason because we think I, it's one of the possible like, things on the I think the Gemara says because in the Garden of Eden, bread grew actually from the tree. It was only the curse that we said, now with the curse of your brow. That's what your brow you have to bring forth bread. It reminds us of what life was like in the Garden of Eden. That no, all our needs were prepared. Like, 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 like That's not real bread. It's just called that. It's it's the but the taste is the same. Does it? No. No, it doesn't. It's like a fruit. It just looks like it. It looks okay. like it, but it's, I'll tell you after. It comes. Okay. So listen carefully, everybody. The job of now the Sultan, disguised as the Snachash of the snake, his job is to test them, to get them to eat. Now, if, you are, if your job, you're the Sultan, well, not, I, didn't, I didn't mean you personally yeah. right? But if, if, you, if you had the assignment of the Nachash of the Satan what might you use as a cunning argument a naked so to speak a cunning argument to get Adam v'chava to eat first of all he approaches Chava why Chava? because Chava didn't hear the commandment directly from God, Adam did was she unconscious when she was attached to that? no she, was, she didn't have a memory of that experience she was part of him but it was whatever it was but it was not a, a separate entity. Adam received the command. So his job was to teach it to Chava. Now, perhaps he taught it correctly, perhaps he didn't talk it correctly, the whole question. But now, if you're the snake, your God gives you this task. Get them to eat. Test them to see if they'll eat. That's the test now. Are they going to pass this test? If they pass this test, boy, creation is done. We could bring now, we could bring them up to, God, to, to Olam Haba, to the perfect state forever. That's the test. What would you think would be a good test? Maybe you would go up to Chava and you'd say, oh, wow, doesn't that look tasty? Doesn't look good. Look at that. Look at that thing. Ooh. Or you might go up to her and you say, you know, if you eat this, you, you know, maybe you get really rich. Ooh, covered, you know. Or you might say, you know, ooh, it doesn't just grab your emotions, you know. It doesn't there's something about it that grabs your heart like a good song. Or, or you might look at it and say, like, just, don't you want to just, like, ever been, ever been had this experience? You've been on a, in the beach in a sunset and, and you just want to like, dive into the sunset, you just want to be part of that experience. I mean, you know, it's just so overwhelming. It's an intellectual experience, by the way, but it's so beautiful. You know, maybe you say, look at that, don't you just dive into it, be, be at one with it. Like, doesn't it appeal to your, to your intellect and to you? And Wouldn't those be good arguments? Listen to the snake's argument and tell me if you think this is a good argument or not. The snake comes to Chava and, it says, and the snake says, For Yomer el Isha. And he says to the woman, Afki Amr Elohim. Even if God said, Lo tochlu mikola eitzagan. Even if God said, Don't eat from the tree of the garden. Let me say it again. The Nachash comes to the Isha and he says, Afki Amr Elohim. Even if God said, Lo toch lumi kol eitzagan. Period. Even if God said, don't eat from all the trees of the garden. Question. What's wrong with that statement? First of all, it's a lie. God didn't say, don't eat from all the trees of the garden. God said, eat from all the trees of the garden, right? But just for one, that's true. Good point. What else, what else grammatically is wrong with that sentence? What, what's your first name again? What's your first name? What is it? Shani? Shani? Sh- 
Shani? What's your, what's your last name? Oh, okay, Shani. Even, 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 even so, so say it, how would it work? Even if God said, don't, even if God said, don't eat from all the fruit, all the trees of the garden. What did you say is wrong with that? Yeah, there's a comma. Even if God said, don't eat from all the trees of the garden. Even if God said, yeah, so, so, uh, go, on. go on. He stops. Grammatically, it's wrong. Even, even if God said, don't eat from all the trees of the garden. Even, even, when you start a sentence with an even, you've got to finish it. Even if God said, don't eat from the trees of the garden, comma. Well, he's a snake. Go ahead and eat. You're, so, you know, whatever it is. Well, he, he leaves it hanging. He, all he says is, even if God said. All he said, even if God said. And you know what she should say back? She should say back, you're right, that's why I'm not doing it, because God said. You know, and not only that, he had such better arguments. He could have said, look how beautiful it is. You know, look, look how it's so tempting. Look, you get rich from it. And you, want to, you just want to be one with it. It's, so, it's like a sunset. You know, go, go for it. That's the best argument. He could come, the crafty snake, the Nachash, who is the Sutton, whose job is to tempt mankind, who has all wisdom of God, you know, all the wisdom he needs before him. The best argument he can give is, even if God said don't eat, and he stops. But he wants to engage in conversation. But the argument is so weak. Even if God said don't eat. I'm thinking if he would have uh, approached her with all the other sentences, she would have just totally ignored him. Oh, he's wa- he wants me to do something wrong. But here he's like engaging her in conversation. He said something that uh, needs a question. What did you just say? I, I, I mean, I'll just read it to you again. Every time I read this, I'm like, it, it says, let me read it. I said, the Yomer El Isha. He says the word, Af means even. Af ki Amar lo Kim. Even if God said, no talk to Nicole, it's a God. Even if God said, like, who cares what God said? Mm-hmm. You know, she just said, well, I care what God said. God's God. That's an argument, even if God said, even if God, I, that's the worst argument you could possibly give, give to make me eat. I'm not going to eat it because God said no. And that's the best argument he could give? What's going on in this story? To me, it's, it's as if um, there is no acknowledgement whether, like, who's God? Basically, that's my understanding. Like, like God just created them. They're in the sixth. They just created two or three hours before. Yeah, it's two hours before God. They're intimately close with God. Who is he? What is he? What? Okay, made me so wise. But but yeah, but uh, my my tofu, But they're very aware of God. They're very aware of God. They're very aware. And that's the best argument. Even if God said, "Don't eat," that's exactly why I'm not going to eat because God said. <laughs> what is the snake? That, what's your first name again? Uh, I know. I know you're from Kiryat. <laughs> The only, the only, I hear what you're saying. You're saying that he's, he's trying to give her a help, or help her not to do it, so to speak. Yeah. The only thing is, I, where I would, I hear what you're saying, and I appreciate it. Where I would disagree is that the, jo- the job of the sultan is to make a real test for us. Because if it's not a real test, then how is the reward that we receive for passing it something really substantial? There has to be something that really challenged the core of who we are. Otherwise, it's not a real test. It has to be a real test. And he's giving the best possible test that he can think of, that he knows. You know, with all his wisdom, he's the Nachash, he's the Satan. The best thing he can say is, even if God said, don't eat. And he stops, as if to apply, so what? You know, <laughs> how is that the best possible argument he can come up with? Now, I'm going to ask one more question, and then before we, we put it, start putting it together. Questions like this. You know, I have a bread maker at home. Suppose I set my bread maker to go off at 10 a.m. And um, my bread maker goes off at 10 a.m. And I say to myself, you know, you went off at 10 a.m.? I'm not happy with that. And so I take my bread maker, I pull out its legs, 
I rip the cord out of the wall, I open the window, and I throw it out the window. Would that be a nutty thing to do? Yes. Why would that be a nutty thing to do? Besides just being a nutty thing to do. Why, would, why is that really a nutty thing? Who is the one who said it? Me. I'm the one who said it to go up at 10 a.m. Does the bread maker have a mind of its own? No. It's a robot. It can only do exactly what I program it to do, like our computers. Correct? There's a question. Does an angel have free will? Does it? Angels on some level are robots. Now, I'll define it more clearly. They're not really robots. They really do have free will to an extent. However, because the reality of God is so in front of them, they therefore have no free will. Do you hear what I'm saying? If God were to reveal himself right now before us, would we still have free will? No. Because his reality would be so clear we could only do that which he wants us to do. And that's why God conceals himself. Before the first act of creation when he created man with a tzimtzum, he closed, he hid himself in order to allow room for us to have free choice. Right? An angel in reality does not have free choice because the reality of God is before them. In essence, really, they have as much free choice as a robot. Because there's no free choice. They can only do that which God wants them to do. Question. Who is the one who told God to test Adam Bukhava? God told us to punish us. God. Question. Why did he punish him? How could he punish him for doing his will? The same way I can't take my bread maker, rip off its legs, throw it out the window, it would be a ridiculous act because I'm the one who programmed it. How can God punish an angel who he assigned the job of testing Adam Bukhava? Then maybe you'll tell me, well, he went too far. No, it can't be. He only can do that which is in the parameters of that which he was programmed to do. That's a sata, that's an angel. There is no goal, there's no free choice to go beyond what you're supposed to do. There's only doing the job. The job here was to appear as a snake, speak to them, engage them in dialogue, and find the best argument you can to get the deed. He did that brilliantly. Was he happy that he failed? I dare say no, probably not. But he did his job perfectly. So how could God punish him? Is that a good question? That's a good question. Maybe, but, but maybe, maybe he did more than, more than just that. What else can he do, Tom? He's too, can, your, can your computer do anything more than that which is programmed to do? Sarah's can. Sarah's computer has a mind of its own. I'm aware of that. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. And her phone, all the sorts of her electronic devices. But most of ours can only do exactly that which we program it to do. That's all, that's all that an angel can do. Nothing more. But you said they're Nothing not programmed. More. They have free will. They have free will. But in essence, the free will is so, so taken away because of the reality of God. So the Satan basically possessed the snake. Not possessed. So was possessed. God placed... The, God, not possessed. Possessed sounds like spooky. God placed, God placed the Satan in this being called the snake. And that was in order... He was in this Nachash. This being called the Nachash. The snake with legs. What's that? It was a snake. It was a snake that could walk... A snake, well, it was a snake that can walk and talk. He can engage you in very high-level intellectual conversation. And, and, and you're not supposed to be surprised by that. You're not supposed to be, oh, this is weird. You're supposed to like, well, this is very natural. Yeah, sir? Maybe you got pleasure there? Well, that's what we said. The Satan never gets pleasure when we do what's wrong. He's God's angel. God wants that we should be tested, but that we should pass the test. He only wants God's desire. There's no personal desire. What's that? Maybe he disrespected God. How can he disrespect God? He's, pro he's, he's programmed to do exactly what God wants. There is no free choice by angels. Just, We're higher than angels. We have free choice. They don't have free choice. We do. Maybe he just uh, wants to check on which level he's like, just to, to follow, like, the, like, start from the low and go up. You know? I, I think yeah. we want to finish with the suspect. We have a, a, a question over here. We question over here. Yeah. Oh, 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 say good, say good. Keep that thought in mind. Keep that in mind. Yeah, keep in mind. Yeah, keep in mind. Um, could it be that it was created for that purpose and that form? And once it completed its purpose and, you know, the job, it was turned into a form that we know as snake. Because, I mean, it would be kind of weird. Like, right, like good, good, good point. You're right. Did it look like the snake that we have today? I dare say no. In fact, that's what I'm saying. He walked and talked. He stood straight up. And, and Adam and Eve naturally engaged it in conversation. Like, this is natural. There's something very, you know, a, appealing about it. You know, very... So, so let, let, just, just one more. let, me, let me just go a little further on the story. I'm going to go right to the end. And listen to what happens at the end. 
Tell me which one of these is not like the other. Did you ever watch Sesame Street? Remember the game, which one of these is not like the other? Okay, we're going to play that game now. Which one of these is not like the other? So God comes after the eight of the eights, and v'yikra Hashem elokim Adam, and God calls to Adam v'yomer lo ayecha. So where are you? What, what's happened to you? You've changed. Ayecha doesn't mean where are you. It means it means what was before me is something different. Where, what what's happened to you? V'yomes kolecha shemata began v'ira. I heard your voice. I was afraid ki aroma nochi ve'chabe. I'm naked and I was afraid and I hid. V'yomer, and God says, God says, who told you that you're naked? The tree which I commanded you not to eat from. Did you eat from it? V'yomer, Adam, and Adam says, Ha'isha, the woman, who you gave to stand beside me. Who knows the limina eitz ve'ochal? Says the woman that you gave to me <laughs> advised me and I ate it so by the way you know it was the first act of of, of <laughs> kafui tov of ingratitude in the world by the way right yeah so I got your question wrong well, I thought you said why was it punishing the snake it is right right well, that's what the, no, the question the question I want to hear in which of these three dialogues we're going to hear a dialogue between Hashem and Adam Hashem and Chava and Hashem and the snake Sorry. and I want you to tell me which of these dialogues is not like the other oh. okay so first thing first dialogue is God says to Adam and he asks Adam the question, and he says, "You know, did you?" He says, "Hamina eats a shirt sifisicha that built a chomim mena achalta. Did you eat from? Did you eat from the tree which I commanded you not to eat from?" Of course, he answers with a tremendous statement of of, of lack of gratitude. He says the woman that you gave me told me to do it. A tremendous act of a tremendous. Act. He should have said, you know, "Right, it's the first act of, of ingratitude in the world, right there." Then he goes to Chava. Then he comes to Chava. And he says to Chava, And God said to the woman, What's this that you did? The Nachash seduced me, he deceived me, he convinced me, and I ate. Then, And God says to the snake, Ki azisa zos, because you did this cursed you will be from all the animals and all the animals of the field and your belly will you crawl and dirt you will eat and there will be hatred between you and between the woman question three dialogues God and Adam, God and Chava God and the snake which one of these three is not like the other. Well, the dialogue well, the the is not the same between, between uh, no, 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 and the snake. Between what? The Chava the conversation is different. Why? Because um, he said to, to, to Adam, did you eat of the tree I told you not to? Mm-hmm. Okay? And then he said to Eve, why did you do this? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh. Okay, let's listen carefully here. Let, listen again. Adam's conversation is, to Adam he says, he says, Did you eat from the tree which I command you not to eat? That's what he says to Adam. To Eve he says, What did you do? And to the snake he says, Ki asisa zos, Because you did this. Mm-hmm. Which one of them is not like the other? The other one's is question. Oh! To Adam he asks a question. Did you eat from the tree that you may not eat? To Eve, he says, to, to, you know, what, we'll not, why did you do this? And to the snake, he says, because you did this. Why doesn't he ask the snake, why did the snake do it? Because he told the snake to do it. Because he told the snake to do it. He doesn't have to ask the snake why he did it. He programmed the snake to do it. There's no need to ask the snake. Punishment. This is what's going to happen yeah. to you. So why have the snake? The snake is not human. The snake is an angel. It's he not a human body. Okay. Are you with me, everybody? Good question. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Don't make it up, guys. Are we good? Are we good? Is you hear the question? You hear the question? It's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. Good question. I want the answer. I want the answer. 
Next week we'll talk about what the. No. Okay. No. Okay. No. Okay. We have. Okay. So, so you hear it. Very, very good. Very, it's beautiful. You know, when you when you're so careful the language of the Torah, it, it, worlds begin to open up. And you got to know Hebrew for this. To do that in English does not work, of course. You have to understand the text. The text is speaking on so many levels and so many layers. And sometimes just an analysis of the simple meaning of the words give you such depth. So obviously to Odom he asked a question, to Ibi asked a question. The snake, there's no question. How could he ask the snake why he did it? I programmed you to do it. You're my bread maker. I can't ask my bread maker why you went off at 10 a.m. I programmed you. I can't ask the snake why you tested Adam this way, even this way. You were programmed. So what, what's going on over here in this story? Let's see if we can put it together, tie it together a little bit. So what we say to you right now is really Rav Hirsch, Shimshon Rafa Hirsch, great German thinker. The approach to the story, I was awakened to it by my friend David Foreman. And I'd like to share it with you. First thing we see is we had a question. That God says that he does not want Odin to be alone. One would have thought right there he should have made it. He doesn't do that. He has Adam go to all the animals in creation and date them, as it were. Take them out, right? Like we, we made fun. Mm -hmm. And Rashi says, it's only when Eve was created that he finally saw, say, oh, zos etsumi atsumi. Finally, I found something I could relate to. Why did God have to make him go through that exercise? I'm going to suggest, about Hirsch suggests, it's because God was preparing Adam and Eve for the test of the snake. God took the satan, places it in this animal called the nachash, this creature called the nachash. Now, who is this creature? This creature is an animal, or disguised as an animal, that can walk and talk. You know, it's almost like you can imagine, like in Walt Disney, you have like an animal that, that can kind of be your friend and can talk to you. And, and almost give you a perspective of what the, the animal kingdom is like. That's the Nachash was. The Nachash was, was almost human-like in the way it could stand up and, and, and walk. There's never been an animal like that in, in history before. And you're not supposed to be surprised by it. It's other words, there's an animal in creation that's like you. And you know what God the test is? The test that the snake says is very simple. The snake says, Avki Amalukim. Even if God said, don't eat. What does he mean by even if God said, don't eat? So we asked the question and said, wait a minute, that's a terrible, that's a terrible way to make the meat. Because Eve should have said back, the reason I'm not going to eat it is because, because God said. He should have used a more cunning argument, like, look how beautiful it is. But Rav Hirsch explains like this. Even if God said, put the emphasis on the word said. Even if God said, don't eat, who cares what God said? Even if God said, don't eat, dot, 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 meaning to imply, who cares what God said? Not who cares what God said because God said it, but who cares what God said? Why do you have to listen to what God says? There's another way God speaks to you. You know what that way is? He speaks to you from your animal side. Just like God speaks to me, the animal, through instinct and drives and passions. God speaks to you through those instincts and drives and passions as well. Don't you have what I have? I have an animal. When I look at that tree, I have a desire for it. I want it. And it arouses all of my celebratory glands. Don't you experience that as well? You're also an animal. Why do you have to listen to God's word? That's one way God communicates to you. It's true. But doesn't God also communicate to you through the words of the animal inside you? This is the first day of creation. What are you? Are you fully a soul? Are you an animal? Which is the more important part? Maybe they're equal. Who cares what God said? Don't listen to the word. Listen to the animal. I have an animal. will tell you what I think. I think you should go eat it and enjoy it. What's wrong with that? Didn't God create those drives? Didn't God create the pleasure? Didn't God cause that when you see such a thing, you start salivating and you start having desires and looking at it and getting hungry and, ooh, and, want, and just want to possess it and be part? Didn't God create that drive? What's wrong with following the animal and who you are? God created that as well. 
What a brilliant argument. And she goes ahead and she eats. Now I dare say that the reason why God first had Adam go to all the animals to see if the animal could be his wife was to prepare him just for that test. Because he knows that's the test the Nachash is going to use. He's programmed the Nachash for that test. But in order to help Adam fight that, he first wants him to go to the animal kingdom and see the animal kingdom is not him. I want you to try to find your mate in the animal kingdom. See how different you are from the animal kingdom. Because when the Nachash comes to you and says, why don't you listen to the animal in you and not what God's word is? The animal is also what God created, those drives and feelings. I want you to be ready for the test and say, wait a minute, but I'm not an animal. I tried to find my mate with all the animals. I couldn't find it. But it's a very convincing argument. It's a very real argument. A very real argument. And the Nachash convinces Chava, and she eats. Now it's interesting. God then goes at the end of the story, and he goes to Adam, he says, why did you do it? Of course, he expressed a tremendous lack of gratitude. He blames it on his wife. He goes to Eve, why did you do it? He says, this Nachash, he's yana, this Nachash, can Nachash deceive me? And then he goes to the Nachash, he says, because you did this. He doesn't ask the Nachash why. He programmed the Nachash to do it. But then he seems to take the Nachash, and what does he do? He seems to punish. Yeah. We're bothered by the question, how can he punish the Nachash? Because Nachash is only doing... He wants to show oh. an example, but... So that's why Rabbi Hirsch says something so brilliant. Who says it was a punishment? Who said it was a punishment? Why do you say it was a punishment? Because it sounds like a punishment. It sounds like a punishment. But maybe it's not at all. All that he's doing, he's saying to the Nachash, I'm going to totally transform you. You stood upright. You looked human. You're not going to crawl on your belly. He says, the offer to you're going to have to live in the dust where there's no taste, no pleasure, no enjoyment. All your days. And there's going to be hatred between you and the woman and between her seed and between you. Said, The human being is always going to want to trample your head. And you're going to always try to bite its heel, their heel. Who says it's not a punishment? What God is doing with the snake is he's taking this being which was so humanoid, which was so like a person, and was like an animal that can say, join me in the animal kingdom. And he's taking that species now, and he's making it so unhuman. And there's no animal in creation today which is more unhuman than the snake. You know, we like going to the Bronx Zoo and seeing the gorillas like we talked about because we're fascinated about how similar they are to us. We like going to the reptile cage. Why? Because we're fascinated about how different they are. Reptiles are not us. We're, we're kind of repulsed by the sight of snakes. Nobody likes snakes. Except, of course, your Lord Voldemort. But he was a weirdo. <laughs> right. The snake is the most unhuman animal out there. And it's an animal which animals fear, not just human beings. God took this creature which said, join me in the animal kingdom, be an animal. And God reduced it to be so unhuman-like that Odom and Chava and you and I will never make the mistake again to think that the real essence of who we are is the animal. The story is really a story about the definition of which voice you listen to in life. Do you listen to God's voice, which is the voice that speaks through Torah and the brain and the neshama? Or do we listen to the voice of passions and drives and instincts, which we also possess, which the animal possesses? It's a test of God's voice versus the animal voice. And they're both God's creation and I dare say on this first day of creation, it wasn't so clear as to which was primary. And perhaps this argument is not dead at all in the world, by the way. A, a, a friend of mine told me that one time he was listening to a late night talk show and there was a discussion with a young man from the Christian right. And this man was explaining why he has chosen celibacy before marriage. And the, the, um, the interviewer confronted him with a the theological bomb and said to him, you know, you're choosing celibacy before marriage? 
Didn't God create those drives? Why are you inhibiting the, God, the drive that God created? Whose argument was that? The snakes. This argument as to which voice is primary, and they're both God's voices, is very alive and well today. And of course, the lesson of the story is really that really what defines us as human beings is the ability to listen to God's voice, to hear God's word, and use it to harness and to control and to rule the passions. Not have our passions, drives, and instincts, which are also God's gifts, rule us. And that's why, of course, we say in Hebrew the word melech, which means a king, is somebody whose moach, his melech, his mem, his brain, right, is above his lave, his heart, his emotion, and both are above his kloyim, which means his kidneys, his lower part of who he is. And that's why God, of course, creates the human being to be the only animal creation which stands straight up to teach us that head, God's word, has to be above heart, and both have to be above passions. Whereas in the animal kingdom, of course, we see animals walk on all fours. Complete line between head, heart, and passions. There's no test to overcome. They're purely instinctual. It's innate. But the snake's not punished. You can't punish a robot. The snake is merely made an example of to teach Adam and even you and I, that the argument that the snake used, who cares what God said? Listen to God's instinct that he created. That argument is baseless. God takes the snake, he cuts off the legs of the snake, as if to say, that argument has no legs to stand on. <laughs> that argument has no support. This animal, which was once the glory of the animal kingdom, is now going to crawl in its, crawl in its belly. There is no support, there is no basis in what the snake tried to use to convince you. Now, on this first day of creation, Adam and Eve had to confront the very essence of who we are. We have instincts, we have passions, we have drives. These are all very good when harnessed in the service of God. But primarily the voice that we have to listen to and the voice that makes us really human is we listen to God's voice. And we're guided by God's word. And we use that to rule the animal in who we are. Yeah, questions? Yeah, Dorothy. So you're saying that, so I understand that God did not program the world to be like this. I think, I think this is exactly how he did program the snake to do it. In other words, it's a brilliant, it's a, in other words, it's a brilliant test. He was hoping that Adam and Eve would pass the test. Free choice would, would allow them also to pass the test. But failure in the test now says, I have to take this animal which presented the idea that you can be an animal. The animal is the primary voice. I have to say that argument the snake used is baseless. There's no legs to stand on. And I have to make the snake so unhuman-like, so unattractive, that you'll never be fooled again. And we'll never be fooled again. How can we fail such a test? How can we fail such a test? So God was trying to prepare him. That's what God said. Try to make with the animals. See if you're an animal. See if you could find like, you see, he comfort in the animal kingdom. Woman. What? He did not like, go directly to the Adam. He what? He did not, like, he found a woman who did not, who wasn't prepared. She didn't go Oh, to so right. So the, so the Nachash, whose job it is to test, yeah, he went right to the woman. Right, he went not to Adam. So prepared. some say that it was Adam's fault, that he should have prepared her better. Maybe Adam didn't prepare for her. Or maybe Chava didn't focus on what Adam said. The whole question is, who is primarily responsible? Some say both of them. But you're right, Nachash went to Chava, not to Adam. Maybe Adam could have withstood the test. But he was supposed to teach Chava what he learned. His job was to prepare her for this test. I learned uh, once um, how to a parent. So over there they said that um, there's a rule, don't butter up the couch rule, that if you're leaving the house and you tell the kids, make sure you don't butter up the couch, What's that you mean? better be sure when you come back there's going to be butter all over the couch. You just gave them an so, they yeah, they would have on their own never ever thought of putting butter on the couch. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But because you came and you told them, make sure you don't put butter on the couch, so now, that's it, now they have to put So you're suggesting the by what? So I'm saying, if Hashem maybe would have never even mentioned the tree, they would have never even touched the tree, mm. but here is even more complicated because imagine I would have told my kids don't put butter on the couch, and then I would have sent my neighbor over with a whole bunch of butter and say, doesn't this butter look really good? <laughs> it would look so beautiful on the couch. <laughs> like, I don't know, it just seems like God set them up. Yes, well, yes, it, was a, like it was a test. It was a test. There had to be a real test. God wanted to give them the ultimate reward and, and give them the ultimate gift.